I see Don as a um, attendee, but not as a uh, um, This is ridiculous. Uh, hello, are we live? Hello, hello. Uh, if you can hear, this is Philip Howard. I'm the chair of the jury. We're having uh, some technical uh, difficulties. No one seems to be able to, uh, speakers seem to be able to log into this. Why don't we give it, we'll give it five minutes.
I'm going to see if anyone can hear me. Uh, Francis Govers, can you hear me? If so, uh, send me a message. I think I'm in. Okay, there you are. Well, they wouldn't allow me to get in until I posted my photo. Until you posted your photo. Okay. So here we are. But in any event, I am here. Uh, so the question is, um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, I can't tell if anyone uh, else can can hear. Um. I can hear you. I have a note from John Micklethwaite that he has trouble trouble uh, signing in. Uh, it's now 1234. Um, and we have a couple of messages saying that members of the audience can hear us. Uh, let me let me just step out just for one second to make sure I get myself set up here and I'll be back in just a moment. OK, I think you're good. Okay, Don, are you back? I am back. Here I am. Okay, why don't um, why don't we have an abbreviated conversation? If uh, if John and Adrian figure out how to join us, they can join us. But um, we ought to at least uh, um, get the gist of what we're talking about here. Um, so uh, there's a new book that came out last week called The Wake Up Call by. Um, John Micklethwaite and Adrian Wooldridge. And the subtitle is Why the Pandemic Has Exposed the Weakness of the West and How to Fix It. Um, it happens to echo themes that both Don, who's a distinguished political scientist at the University of Texas, and, and I have written in, uh, in our own books. And, and that has to do with the operating systems of modern well, in our case, particularly U.S. government, that um, that no longer have the capability of making the kind of choices needed to prepare for a pandemic and to respond effectively um, when we have a pandemic. And it's not a problem just of the pandemic. It's also a problem with how we run public schools. It's a problem of um, health care costs and excess bureaucracy in health care, taking a decade to sometimes to get permits for a needed infrastructure project. So we have this kind of paralytic state that's been created that neither party is talking about. Uh, Don and I both uh, read uh, the new book. And as I say, we've, we've um, written a lot on the subject ourselves. <laughs> so Don, what's your, what's your takeaway here? What is it that, um, that needs to be discussed about modern government that, that is not being discussed. I, I think that's the, the first and most important point, Philip, because the challenge is that so much of what it is we absolutely need to talk about that, in fact, we are not talking about. Uh, not only was, for example, the American presidential debate an absolute disaster the other night, but almost <laughs> all the other conversations, that, that's one thing everybody can agree on. But, but, <laughs> but, but the thing on top of that is that if you at least get past that, there's so little discussion beyond what kind of policies we ought to have about how to try to make sure the results happen. 
And the evidence for needing to do that is pretty clear. It's the, we need to try to build and rebuild trust in government. And that is one of the things across the world that is, as even the OECD has argued, is one of the most important things we have in our minds. But there's research from McKinsey that suggests that something like 76% of all the trust in government is the product of the interactions between citizens and government. And that clearly is not working very well at all. And so the big challenge that we've got is to try to first put this on the agenda and second move from an obsession with trying to make policy decisions to figure out how we produce results and then finally making sure that those results are real for citizens. And those are the, the better arc principles. And unfortunately, they're things we just are not talking about. Right. But and so so one problem is that is that political leaders tend to talk in terms of kind of broad policy goals. Let's address, you know, which are important, climate change or income stagnation. And they don't tend to focus on what I'll call the operating system of government. You know, how does government how is government responsive to citizens? How does government make or try to manage schools so that they're effective? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so that's one problem. And then the second layer of the problem, it seems to me, is that is that we're not uh, addressing a kind of a rot in the principles underlying how we've organized government. So, the, you know, every president since Jimmy Carter in the U.S. has promised to get rid of excess bureaucracy. And stuff. Nobody's <laughs> done it, you know. And, and so why is it that everybody who promises to fix things always fails? Change we can believe in was Obama's campaign theme. Why do you think no one can get it done? I have a theory, but I want to hear yours. Yeah, and I think part of it is that it's just, first of all, it's not top of mind that there are a kind of broad adherence to principles without figuring out how to try to make it work. There is not an adequate focus on outcomes, and instead we focus on process. So the degree to which we really focus on just the uh, just even the issue to begin with, which we tend not to, we focus on being obsessed with process rules that instead of what it is we're actually producing in terms of outcomes for citizens. And then the third point, and this gets directly to so much of what you've written about, Phil, which is that then the process gets so tied up in red tape, so tied up in nonsense in so many cases, that it becomes even further disconnected from what government's trying to do. So it's getting it on the agenda, focusing on process instead of outcomes. And then when we focus on process, getting so tied up in red tape and problems and process and poor incentives and all the rest, that it ends up creating a government that, in fact, doesn't do what it is we say we want to do. And we're seeing that so clearly now in the way in which so many governments have reacted poorly to COVID. Yeah, that's right. And so the the, the countries that, that responded effectively, and, uh, and John Nicholthwaite and Adrian Wolveridge go through them, are not just the Asian co- countries, which have different cultures and different authority structures, um, but also some of the European countries, like Germany, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have, um, but they all have a... Uh, a kind of respect for authority when authority is needed. I mean, Germany actually has quite a um, a, a federal system, if you will. It's quite you right. know there are lots of there are lots of authority that delegated to the states for, for example, how to run schools and that sort of thing. But when it comes to something like COVID, they they made centralized decisions about how to close down, when, right. how to get the protective equipment, you know, all that sort of thing. And, 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 and we've lost that. But I think that, um, so one of the things that, that you suggested was missing was a focus on results, that we focus on process and rules instead of results. And I, I guess, you know, what I would add to that is one of the reasons we focus on process and rules is because particularly in, in, in the United States, and this has always been true, we have a, um, almost obsessive distrust of letting anybody have authority. You know, <laughs> if, you know, even if they can be accountable. It was true with the Articles of Confederation. You know, it didn't let anybody have authority. That's why it didn't work. Uh, and it's true, many, many examples through, th- through history. And uh, the, the rub 
comes when you get the modern state where the state is overseeing all kinds of complex things. The safety and adequacy of health care provision. You know, these are complex subjects and, you know, and, and other things. And it's trying to do so with, um, with rules and procedures uh, in situations that are just not susceptible. You can't follow a 10,000 page rule book and successfully take care of a patient. One, humans can't keep it all straight, but you have to, you have to actually rely to a certain extent on the, on the professionalism <laughs> of the healthcare providers. And, and we've created a system designed to avoid human judgment at the point of implementation. And so if you look at, there are 150 million words in federal law, more or less, in regulation. You know, probably 1% of those rules, of those words, actually say what the goal is and what the guiding principle should be for whatever the regulatory system is in healthcare. The other 99% is prescribing exactly how to achieve it. And, uh, you know, no other country really does that. Even the EU, which is not great <laughs> when it comes to regulation, <laughs> you know, you know, doesn't, doesn't go this far. And so, you know, I, you know, my view is that, is that the operating systems are kind of terminally paralyzed. Uh, but not because Republicans are right, not because people want to get rid of government, everybody wants clean air, but because we were unable to make the kind of choices needed to, not only to fix COVID or to deal with COVID, but to do much of anything else in our public life. Right, and exactly. Uh, and there's a, there's a paradox here, I think, that is absolutely central to what you're talking about. And that gets first the question that you talked about, about the successes of some countries. And it turns out that if you look at New Zealand and Germany in particular, both of them have been very successful in comparison to the U.S. in keeping the, the virus under control and beating it back when it reared its head. And what they both have in common was a different system, a different kind of operating system of government and a, a profound trust of citizens in the authority of government officials and their expertise to try to call the shots. And what's especially important about Germany is that in the United States so often we're arguing, you know, it's the real problem is that we have this federal system where we have so much reliance on state and local governments. And so federal systems just can't solve the problem. We need more authoritarian Chinese kind of system. But it turns out that Germany is a federal system, too. They did much better. So it's not inherent in federalism, for starters. And the other piece of it, and you, you put your finger exactly on the key issue when you were talking about complexity. We have systems that are increasingly complex. And by that, I mean we have very, very complicated problems that often rear up in unpredictable ways, affecting people in ways that have lots of spillover effects. And that to be able to get to the solutions, we need lots of different organizations, public, private, nonprofit in the United States, federal, state, and local. In New Zealand, it was a matter of getting the central and the local governments working effectively together. But there are problems that nobody, no level of government, no organization can fully put its arms around. And so what you've got is a set of complex problems that require complex solutions that required organizations and levels of government and even governments across the world to work together. And the more that you drill down to rules and regulations to prescribe each individual interaction, the farther you get away from the systems that we need to try to deal with these complex problems. And that, I think, is, is exactly what you're talking about and why so often that, especially here in the U.S., we are increasingly stumbling. But it is a broader yeah. problem around the world. Right. There's uh, the, uh, the the writer Nassim Taleb, who um, wrote the book The Black Swan and, and writes about complexity and such, uh, has made the point that the more complex the issues, the simpler the organizational framework has to be, because people have to be able to bob and weave. They have to be able to uh, adapt to unforeseen circumstances here versus there, to take into account... As, as the economist Friedrich Hayek put it, the circumstances of time and place, the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean they can do whatever they want. They don't have discretion. It means they have goals to achieve results and principles and such, but people are free to try to get there honoring the circumstances in front of them and yeah. using and, their own. Yeah. You know. yeah. And and we've got some, some evidence about how that works. For example, here in the U.S., where we've had 
lots of trouble tackling this issue, but where there's a small organization called the U.S. Digital Service that was created after the profound failure of the launch of Obamacare. And when the website collapsed and they said, we, we just can't allow this to happen again, they created this 200-person organization. And a couple things are important about the way that they attack problems because they do it very successfully. The first is one of their, one of their senior people told me, the more complicated and complex a problem, the smaller the team they have working on it for exactly the reason you talked about. But you can move faster, move farther, think smarter by making sure that you can have enough people to embrace the issues, but to be able not to get it all globbed up with, with red tape and procedures on the inside. And the second thing that they do is that they focus on what they call bureaucracy hacking. That is, they look at the barriers that so often are in place and say, you know, you can't do this. We have rules against it. We have regulations. We, there's, that's not the way we do things around here. They say, no, 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 that's nonsense. Let's start by understanding what is it can be done. Let's find somebody else who's done it. Let's find ways of making sure that the lawyers don't get in the way. Let's find ways of actually achieving the outcomes, but doing it within the law and doing it in a way that is, in fact, accountable to the law and accountable to the citizens. And we can do that to move quickly. And so the, I think the evidence is that, in fact, it's possible to develop a new operating system, but it requires a very different way of thinking and working and acting on the way in which we, in fact, operate government. And, yeah, and it also requires um, a, a kind of awareness that we have to change the operating system. I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, people go into office and they try to reform it. Like Kat Sunstein was very smart, you know, regulatory reformer for Obama. He made sure that new regulations were less complicated, but he didn't even have as his ambition the idea of actually replacing the system with one that was more adaptable and, and simple. The, the funny thing about this problem is it's something that real people uh, instinctively understand readily. You know, it's not, it's not at all complicated. There was a poll last year by the University of Chicago and AP that you've cited that uh, where, where two thirds of Americans favored, I think it was major structural overhaul of government was the phrase. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And yet you have neither party with one sentence of a platform on how they would overhaul government to make it work better. There was nothing in the Democratic yeah. debates about making it work better. Everybody's promising, promising the moon to voters, but they weren't talking about making government work better. It seems like, the, it, do you think the political leaders are smarter than we are? That, or, I mean, no, how I could there be such a disconnect? Yeah, I think actually the, I think the people are smarter. And I think the people who deliver services at the grassroots are smarter. But the problem is that the the folks who are making these decisions are still operating within a set of blinders and set of tunnel vision that really restrict their ability to be able to see forward and not to be able to make those those connections on the ground. I think that's part of the problem. I think part of it is that the the rise of media and social media in particular put a, such a high priority on on position taking and the kind of echo chambers that exist there. It's like that's a second problem. I think a, a third problem is that we increasingly are just drifting into strategies of governance that are not outcome focused and that are not really directed to that. And then there's and there's a fourth problem too. And that is in some ways, especially in the US more profound, but I see it in other places around the world as well in major democracies. The, but it will be a special issue having to deal with whatever it is that the president who's elected in November has to deal with in January. And that's what to do about the next round of COVID. And the problem is this, that on the left, there's this tendency to think big and to dream large and to make enormous promises, but not think about how to carry them out. And so people end up walking away saying, well, these guys don't know how to do anything. On the right, there is a instinct that government is too big too large, too overbearing, needs to be shrunken. And so the instinct there is to try to cut it wherever possible, to push government out to the private sector, to cut the size of the public service that is responsible for carrying things out. So what we have are both parties complicit in the effort to try to push ourselves deeper into these problems so that not only do they not pay attention, but they have instincts that in fact drive 
the system in opposite directions, put the two of them together, and we have an especially dangerous combination. And surely the case in the US, but you can see that as well in other countries around the world. And to the degree to which we, we can't really think about how to deliver, and we have our, our governments pushing us in different directions, then it pushes them even further away from what has to happen to the grassroots to get to this new operating yeah. system that you've talked about. I mean, one of the, um, um, I'm sorry that, that John and Adrian aren't on, because I think one of the, one of the instincts to move toward these authoritarian leaders, like in Poland and in Hungary and other places, has been, uh, public dysfunction. You know, there's this, there's this sense, uh, you know, Mussolini promised to make the trains run on time. And, um, and, and there's this broad sense, uh, in democracies around the country, that the trains don't run on time. Right. That, that, yeah, you know, that nothing, uh, that nothing is working. Um, but what you and I are both saying is that that's not an inherent aspect of government. It has to do with an operating system that doesn't let people actually be in charge of the classroom or the trains or whatever they're doing. Right. So, so, um, so what's the path from here? Do we have to start a new political movement? Do we start first an intellectual movement, the kind of uh, responsibility for results movement? <laughs> or, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, uh, what, Great question. Yeah. Great question. And, and I think uh, I'm looking at the chat box on the side, and Brett Johnson is saying it's a, the FDA is a classic example of the problem of rule-based systems. And now we've got the, the problem of rapid COVID tests that are, just so difficult to try to get out to the nursing homes and to the other places that need them because of these problems of entrenched bureaucracies. How, how do we deal with this problem? And I think it's a two-step piece. One is that I think it's incumbent on anybody who can get the platform to work hard to put this on the agenda. It simply has to be something that we talk about. And I think the way we talk about it is to try to, as best we can, put together just a diagnosis of what the problem is. Not only just that we have red tape getting in the way in the way that, that uh, Mr. Johnson's talking about, but also more fundamentally, the problem of making sure that we actually pay attention to what the, the basic driving principles ought to be. But then the other thing is that, that it's this may be just far too big of a problem to take in a single bite and to try to if, say that the only answer is to try to engage in a, in a major governmental transformation, which we surely need but I'm also convinced that the only way we're going to be able to get progress is to work from the bottom up on the other side, to try to empower people who are encountering problems and finding ways of making solutions work. The, the people that I trust most about how to best deal with COVID-19 COVID are the people who are working in intensive care units and hospitals and clinics who deal with patients and see what works. We, we've got to build from the bottom up in this and so many other areas based on evidence to try to drive the system more toward results. So putting this yeah. on the agenda from the top and then driving with results from the bottom, I think is the best way we're going to meet in the middle. Yeah, is it, I would, um, I, I think I would say it slightly differently, which is um, uh, uh, I think you have to give the people on the bottom the sense that they should start thinking for themselves and doing for themselves the way people in yeah. emergency rooms and hospitals have to do because they're faced with, you know, life and death situation. Um, uh, but I think that does require uh, an expansion of the public narrative where people um, start saying, why am I disempowered from doing what I think is right? Why can't I, when I go through the day, ask what's the sensible thing to do here and act on it instead of having your nose stuck in rule books yeah. all day long? Yeah. And and let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Phil. But but I did. Uh, l let me tell a quick story, if I can, about the the response to Hurricane Katrina, which was as big a mess in the United States as we have had until COVID-19. And Admiral Thad Allen was sent down by the president to try to find a way to turn things around. And on his first day on the job, he held a meeting for all the people who were working on it on the front lines. And they were despondent, they were dispirited, they were out there trying to do their best, and they were just getting beaten up at every corner. He said, there are two things I want you to know, two things I want you to do. First, I want you to treat everybody that you encounter as if they were a member of your own family. And then second, if you get into any trouble with that, know that I've got your back. Two principles. 
and it not only transform morale but actually transform their their operations because telling people treat the people that you encounter as if they were a member of your own family in fact empowers them to use their professional judgment to figure out what in fact is best and that's part of what turned things around you know i've never uh, like you i've i've studied uh, public institutions for a long time and i've never found a successful institution a successful school a, a procurement office in the federal government i've never found one that worked where the people within it didn't feel that they had a sense of ownership of their choices, that they were going to make the right thing happen. You know, every single one. And often in the case of schools, the, the principal achieves this by saying a version of what Fat Allen's saying, I've got your back. And by the way, don't worry about the rules. My daughter taught at a public school, a very high performing public school in New York. Um, and the principal would spend half of Friday filling out forms certifying that the teachers had done things that they didn't do. And, and, and that was a way that that principal let the teachers focus on the students rather than focusing on, um, you know, on compliance with red tape and such. Yep, exactly. And the thing is that they're, there's some strategies that can be used. There's, for example, much more focus on employee engagement, which sounds like a kind of wonky consultant speak kind of strategy for trying to sell people lots of human resources kind of consulting enterprises. But the, the reality is that if you find ways, and there are lots of ways of doing it, to engage employees and make those engaged employees responsible for results and to make those results connected to citizens, that's the core of the transformation that right. you talk about. And that's uh, NASA in the United States government is the best place to work. And the right. question is why, how did that happen? And there is a story that's told, which turns out to be true, where somebody came up to a janitor working inside the NASA headquarters building and said, what do you do here? He said, my job's helping to put man on the moon. And the idea that a janitor would see as part of his mission, the fundamental pursuit of the agency's overall mission, that people are engaged with that. And you can see that in the NASA culture from top to bottom. That, that is what it is that drives the organization towards success and makes the place a good place to work. And that's, that's a set of lessons that, in fact, can be learned and can be taught and can be emulated and can be spread. And that's the, that's the, the driving DNA, if you will, of the core of creating this new operating system. Yeah, it's interesting. Um... Uh, another word for what you're talking about is empowerment. Right. And, you, you know, and all the people who took to the streets in America in 2020 are people who took to the streets because they feel disempowered. They took to the streets because bad cops had kept their job, even though everybody knew they were bad cops and had terrible records, because the police chief didn't have authority to fire the bad cop, you know, before the incident. They took to the streets because, um, um, COVID was, was, was spreading and there's no coherent theory about, you know, how are we going to contain the virus? So people, you have a sort of American individualism gone wild, you know, where people say, I'm going to, I'll, I'll wrestle COVID to the ground all by myself. Well, that doesn't work either. So, um, so there is this sense that, uh, that we're kind of in a food fight of some kind, you know, where every, yeah. you know, where society isn't really run by anybody. It's a version of the debate the other night between Trump and Biden where, where people screaming at each other. Um, and what they need is a sense of ownership like that janitor had a sense of empowerment. Um, but I think that requires a new narrative. Yeah, um, well, it definitely. It needs, it needs a new narrative, a new story, a new goal, a new, a new piece and empowerment for the people who essentially get what it takes to be able to make things happen. But there are yeah. so two, two pieces here. One is that the, the police violence problem in America is an enormous one. But what's important, if you start looking around at the data to recognize here, is that it, it's not universal. Not all police departments have this problem. So if some police departments have figured out how not to do this, while other police departments are plagued by problems of violence, and the data are pretty clear on that, then it tells you that it's possible to figure out how to do this better. So that's the hopeful piece on all this. The second thing is that the, the fundamental reality of governance in the 21st century 
is the fact that we have these complex problems that have to be dealt with through complex systems. And the only way to do that is to empower people at the bottom to make the connections among all the different elements. Uh, another quick story. Uh, the, one of the biggest problems in the United States is the problem of homelessness, of individuals on the streets without any kind of permanent housing. And the city of Houston has made enormous progress. They've reduced the rate of homelessness by more than 50% in the last five years. And the way in which they've done that is that they have 100 different, 100 different organizations that have different pieces of the effort, but they have a strong consensus that we need to do this. They have a system that is coordinated and brought together through strong leadership. And they have a system that is reinforced by data that tells them what the problems are and what solutions are working. And so all those things are evidence of the fact we, we can do this, but right. it requires empowering people in the front lines, but supporting them with top level leadership and driving these systems, not by hierarchy, but by data to try to reinforce what works. So we do more of what it is that's good and less of what's bad. Right. And the one thing I would uh, um, add to that uh, is that, is that hierarchy is not bad. It's needed to come up with a coherent strategy to have the protective materials for COVID to come up with a plan um, to wear masks, for example, because COVID doesn't, re you know, respect state borders, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, uh, but, but hierarchy can't make a school successful and can't deal with a particular homeless person. They all have their different issues. Um, you know, we, um, uh, I, I just launched this new thing called Campaign for Common Good, mm -hmm. where we're rolling out um, our own presidential platform, but it's all based on making the operating system work better. And um, one of the leading experts in homelessness, whom I believe has been working in Houston, among other cities, called me out of the blue after watching, uh, you know, a, a one of the forums about what we were doing and said uh, that she wanted to incorporate their, uh, our principles of empowerment into our campaign for remaking the operating system, because it's so clear that homelessness can't be dealt with within the clunky way that most cities do it. You really do have huh. to give local organizations and particular neighborhoods ownership you know, and let them deal with the particular problems of the particular people, you know, in a, in a way that makes sense. And um, so that's quite exciting, you know, that we yep. can. And so so what we're trying to do is create a kind of a, um, a loose affiliation, a big tent, if you will, of people who who want to make government work again. Uh, at, at the end of John Nicholthwaite's and Adrian's book, they have a, uh, uh, chapter called "Make Government Great Again," <laughs> you know, which is of course right. the opposite of what Donald Trump said. But um, uh, but I think most most people, probably in most countries, certainly Americans, have a strong instinct towards the practical. We just want stuff to work. You know, forget about ideology. You know, you can take people of very different ideologies and give them the same problem, and they'll come up with similar solutions because they'll want to solve the problem. Right. Exactly. And, 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 and that's not, and that's what's not happening. So, so I guess the takeaway from this talk, I don't know if we have any uh, questions. Yeah. Maybe and we, we have one from, uh, yeah, we have one from, from Julie Norton who's saying, could you please talk a bit about the difference between the situation in the UK and the US? And uh, that, and that's a, sort of a, a great, a great question. Uh, one of the things that unfortunately both countries share is fairly poor performance in dealing with COVID-19. And what both of them share is a great difficulty in, in messaging and leadership from the top in terms of making the situation clear at the bottom. Uh, what is fascinating, though, in both countries is that both in terms of the, uh, the head of the government in Scotland and the head of the government in New York, we have leaders who have been exceptionally successful at being able both to message clearly and drive the system more toward results. And so there are... I think some tremendous similarities, despite the different forms of government, that reinforce the idea of this new operating system. I think. Yeah, I think that um, I, I encourage uh, Julie to read um, the wake-up call by by, by Michael Clayton Woolridge. They 
they're they're both English and they they talk a lot about why England has failed. And part of the reason is poor leadership, but part of the reason is also, I think, the the um, the structural problems that resulted in England in some of the same balkanization that happened in the U.S. So that you know people were kind of floundering around. Um, uh, you know, my takeaway or, or my the thing I'd like to leave leave the listeners behind with is is this idea that that we're at a kind of 1917 moment. Things are changing all around the world. You know, we see it. You know, you, you feel the tectonic plates kind of shifting and moving. And and you have all these extremists on both sides saying get rid of government, get rid of regulation or, you know, sort of reparations or whatever it is on the left. And who knows where we're going to land? You know, it's, <laughs> a very, you know it's, 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 it's like 1917. Um, but I think where we need to land is to create uh, coherent lines of authority for operating systems to make choices, to give permits for infrastructure or whatever, that reserve to localities and to individual people room to take responsibility. They have to, whether it's dealing with the homeless or dealing with a patient in the hospital or dealing with a student in a school, you can't be asking as your first question, what does the rule require? You've got to be able to be able to solve the problem in front of you. And that requires a different framework. Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the things that I think uh, is fundamental to this is I mean, just how depressed should we be? And it's easy to make a pretty strong <laughs> case about being depressed because heaven knows there's so much craziness, but you know the, the the good news about so much insanity floating around at the very top levels of government is that it actually creates a lot of operating room for people at the bottom to do stuff that that actually it does make common sense. And and Philip, you've you've talked about that. You've got a book on common sense government that tries to explore this, and I've got a book called The Divided States of America, which talks about the the ways in which, unfortunately, the the process in the United States is, is shredding our system of governance. But, but what we both share is, I think, a, a commitment toward the idea of figuring out the, the basic core and common elements that government ought to pursue and understanding that we have to find ways of achieving them that require leadership for sure, but empowering people at the bottom to ensure that we can actually make things work. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Well, I, you know, I'd like... Um if people are interested in in how other countries did dealt with COVID, I would definitely read the Micklethwaite and Wildridge book, The Wake Up Call. Uh, if they're interested in why balkanization, you know, doesn't work in various settings, I think I'd read Don's book, The Divided States of America. Uh, my latest book is called Try Common Sense, and our initiative is at commongood.org, and I've gotten Don involved in it. Um, um, Perhaps out of a sense of desperation that there's nothing else credible <laughs> there to, 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 to sign on to. But I do think there's an opening. Uh, someone said it's dark. It's before the dawn. Um, it does seem pretty dark right now in terms of the future of government. But in a crowded world, we need government oversight to protect against your food, pandemics, to make sure people play by the same rules of the game, um, take care of people who are left behind, and the government educate young people. And the government that does that has to be effective. And it's not going to be effective because somebody sits in an ivory tower. It's going to be effective because the people on the ground, the officials, the teachers, everyone else is working really hard and feels pride like the janitor at NASA and doing a good job. And we have to give them back the um, authority and dignity, I think, yeah. to yeah. create, right. create, um, to recreate kind of uh, functioning democracies that people are proud of. Right, exactly. And the, the underlying message of what you're talking about is that we need government. The idea of doing away with government is simply not possible given the problems that we're facing. But we need a different kind of government, and we need a government that is not captured by ideas from the left, that is full of big ideas without 
the ability to be able to execute, or the perspective of the right that says that government's just too big, let's slash it and, and kneecap it wherever possible. But we've already demonstrated those two strategies don't work. And so what we need, I think, is a new operating system that, in fact, does push us forward. Right. So thank you all for appearing. I'm sorry that we didn't get the, uh, the, the, the charming Brits to be on to talk about their, their, their new book, The Wake Up Call. Um, Don and I are going to sue them for not showing up. <laughs> Use the law against them. And, um, and please, uh, please stay in touch. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. One last question. To what extent is the lack of responsibility of individuals to be resolved by government? Um, it depends on whether the irresponsibility is public or not. Uh, a teacher who doesn't do her job should be relieved of the responsibility. That's true with any an official who's mean spirited should be relieved of responsibility. A uh, a business owner who dumps chemicals into the water system. <laughs> should be prosecuted. So, so government responsibility is important, um, but both for internal administration and external law reasons, but we need to be able to hold each other responsible. So if you're dealing, you're trying to solve the problem of homelessness, uh, you, you have to run an organization. Some people will be good at dealing with People who are troubled and some people won't be. Well, you've got to make those choices. And, you know, some cops will be good at inspiring the trust of people in the neighborhood and some won't be. Well, you've got to make those choices. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're in this pickle is, is because we can't hold people responsible. Accountability has disappeared. So we replace that with lots of rules. Did you follow the rule? So you need both. It's a, it's it's uh, you can either have a rule bound system or you can have a responsibility system which requires accountability. You can't have responsibility without accountability, and that's I think critical to the, um, to the new system. So please uh, please go visit, stay in touch with our writings. I don't know if you have a website, Don. Yep, I I do, and I'll be happy to send that out to everybody. It's at the LBJ School, University of Texas at Austin. Great. And, and I'm at commongood.org. Uh, thank you again. Thanks so Bye. much to everybody. Thank you. Right. Bye.